Good morning, everybody, or early afternoon for some. Uh, my name is Stephen Leonard. I'm the Operations and Program Manager for Nextivation, which is a part of Penn State New Kensington. Uh, I'm happy you could join us today, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, this is going to be our third session in our uh, Setting the Future Ready Foundation video series that we've been conducting for the last month, uh, which is focused on our Nextivation initiative. So I'm glad to have you on board. The topic for today is going to be the Internet of Things, or IoT, uh, data collection everywhere. Uh, if you're joining us uh, for our, uh, our first time, this will be a recorded session. Now, some of you had the opportunity to join us for our last two sessions, and they will be readily available on our Nextivation website. They're there now. Um, you learned a little bit about the introduction into Industry 4.0 for those that joined the last two, as well as the return on investment for Industry 4.0. If you didn't get a chance to attend any of the sessions, not to worry. You can see the re recordings on the videos that are on our website. Uh, this is going to be a continuation, and it's going to get us into IoT. So a couple of things. Uh, you'll notice that your microphones are muted and your video is turned off uh, for the participants. We need to do this so that allows Dr. Chufi our uh, speaker to be able to talk and share the information about the topic. Uh, however, we will be recording this session and uh, we'll have an opportunity for you to maybe ask questions and answers throughout uh, the course of the presentation. So use the QA feature, uh, which is on the bottom of your screen. It should be right in the middle and you can click on it and you can type in your question. Now we ask that you give one question at a time uh, that way uh, we can answer them in a very orderly fashion as we do so. We'll have a chance to answer those questions at various breaks throughout the presentation. Uh, the other ground rule is that, uh, again, we the microphones muted and video off, and uh, we uh, allowed Dr. Chufi to talk a little bit about uh, his uh, presentation. At uh, moments during the presentation, we're going to have the opportunity to uh, participate in interactive polls. So we'll be able to allow you to uh, use your clicking gears and be able to either on your phone or on your computer uh, answer the poll questions. There'll be a total of two poll questions uh, and you can participate and be able to uh, see what kind of answers we get. Dr. Chufi will be able to look at the results and then have a little bit of discussion about it. And at the end of that, uh, we'll be able to uh, allow you um, a chance to maybe answer a few questions. Uh, we can't answer all the questions, uh, depending on how many there are, but it'll give you a chance to be able to uh, ask questions of Dr. Chufi. So with that, I'd like to introduce our presenter and open the floor to Dr. Joseph Chufi as he will deliver today's presentation. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, uh, Steve. Um, thank you all for joining this morning. Uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to gather with folks, even if it's only virtual these days. Um, I, I'm Dr. Joe Chupi. I'm the program coordinator and uh, faculty in the uh, EMET program at Penn State New Kensington. That's our, that's our four-year engineering degree in automation, industrial automation and robotics on campus. Um, I'm, I'm from the area. I, I went to Penn State. <laughs> Uh, my background's actually in, in semiconductor chip processing and fabrication and microfabrication. Uh, I found that a couple of companies that spun out of Penn State and uh, I went to a, a laboratory, moved out of the area for a while, uh, moved back to Pittsburgh a few years ago, and I am uh, very excited to be back at New Kensington, uh, Penn State New Kensington, and, and my interests are currently in smart manufacturing and helping to educate uh, students and engineers on smart manufacturing and uh, really help to, to continue the manufacturing excellence in our region and revitalize it. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to be part of this Nextivation effort here on campus. I like to start uh, talking about you know, future readiness and Industry 4.0 with the idea that data is at the core of everything. All of these uh, topics that we noted in our prior presentations that revolve around this field of Industry 4.0, the glue that holds them together and the information that passes between them is all data, right? All digitalized data that, that moves through and fuels this, these, these technologies and the benefits that we can gain from them. You know, we are in an information age, and I always like uh, these articles and quotes, one coming out of The Economist, that 
the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And that's monetized data. Um, when you think about some of the largest companies in the world, uh, from uh, Google to Amazon to Facebook, their business is data. <laughs> not just selling something or advertising, but the data that goes along with it, the data about you, uh, the data that they gather from the internet is a very powerful thing. So with data at the core of Industry 4.0 and future readiness, uh, today we're gonna look at one of those ways to, to add more data to the ever-growing data story that we have about humanity, and that's through the internet of things. You know, this technology, uh, IoT, Internet of Things, is one of the sources of data. It allows you to collect data from more locations, more things, and add to all of the data streams in here. And to, to really fuel that, the data decision, uh, data-driven decision-making and visibility into your products, your customers, everything else. So that's... You know, I started data and then here we talk about Internet of Things being one of the providers of that data. So, you know, when you look at the definition of Internet of Things, uh, I like this one here where it's um, connecting any, any device with an on and off switch to the Internet. Uh, you know, and, and that's somewhat true. Uh, there are some exceptions, but fundamentally, if you look at the ages of the Internet and, I, and I, this graphic from Nokia was, was very interesting to me, always has been. But we think, you know, I, I grew up pre-internet, pre-SMS, pre but just, you know, human to human interaction, phones, things like that. Um, we moved very quickly in, in the, what, mid-90s into the internet uh, and having that widely available to folks. And the first generation of the internet was the internet of content. Yes, we had email that we started to use, but, you know, web pages of that time were very informational. You know, people started posting up uh, web pages of interest groups, companies started having their little advertising, but it was the www dot phase where everyone was getting web pages and 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 uh, having fun with that. It very quickly, very quickly by the end of the '90s moved into uh, commerce, right? Uh, you know, from Yahoo to Amazon blew up in this era where you now had uh, services. It started with shopping, connecting, Craigslist all the way through banking and everything else uh, that, that now is considered the internet of services. Uh, where we really um, used it for that. Uh, in the 2000s and beyond, uh, it has become the internet of people where we now socialize, uh, I suppose even more so now during quarantine, uh, but social media has taken over and, and many of these companies have become very large uh, being information between people and, and shuttling that around and allowing people to connect. So the Internet of Things is an extension of that, where now machines are all connected to this internet and trafficking around data on their own. Okay, And that's the sort of machine-to-machine -machine communication where they're now all logging on to the internet. You know, when you think about it, I, I your, your first visibility into this is into your consumer devices, right? And <clears throat> of all the different things that you've purchased over the past couple of years for your home, the amount of things that have asked, hey, why don't you go ahead and connect this to your Wi-Fi, right? It's, it's quite uh, incredible. I, I noticed the other day in looking at what's connected to my router, for example, there's all this stuff and I don't even remember putting these things on, but I have everything from garage doors, thermostats, uh, all the different phones and computers in the house. If you have Fitbits, refrigerators connect to the internet nowadays. Uh, I, I'm not often sure why some of these things need to connect to the internet, but you can imagine uh, what the, the benefits of that. So one of the first things I wanna talk about and with a poll question is here, why is this a trend? Why are all of our consumer devices connecting to the internet? So let's start with this first poll question. And so the question is, in your opinion, what is the top reason why IoT is being integrated into consumer products? Uh, so these will be the answers. So let's see here. Steve, do you want to follow so I'm going to, yeah, I've just launched the poll for everybody. So if 
you could go ahead and use your clicking fingers and answer the question, answer the question based either on yourself or your organization, uh, what your opinion is on the top reasons why IoT is integrated into consumer products. So we're gonna give you a minute to do that. So go ahead and answer the poll questions. You should be able to answer it. Starting to come in. Yeah, getting more. Ooh, a good mix so far. And give it another uh, 15 or 20 seconds. Just about everyone's voted. All right, another couple of seconds. Okay, well, I'm going to end the poll and then Dr. Chu, if you take it away. All right, I'm going to try to what share the results here. All right, and um, so I have this up on my screen. If you can't see the results um, on my screen or through your, your own app, uh, shoot a little note in the Q&A box. But I uh, have some interesting stuff here. So, so uh, <clears throat> manufacturers collect, use data to improve project features development. Uh, that is the, the winner. It looks like loser is it's the latest Fadden technology, with, which actually makes me laugh a little bit because of all the things I, I've seen, I see that companies want to throw IoT in their product just because everyone else is doing it and they think that they should. So I would have almost put this up there. Uh, no one thought about it here. <clears throat> when it comes to consumers want this, oh, I'm surprised even one person said yes. I mean, oftentimes it's more annoying to do this stuff. Oh, why would I need that connected to the internet? I don't want to do that. Um, devices can be updated with latest control software. That's a very engineering thing. If it's already connected to the internet, we can, we can update it and repopulate it with stuff. Vendors collect and sell your data. Mm. And market other products to you based on your preferences. You know, these are some of the largest money makers in the modern economy. I think you'd be surprised and how much money this makes uh, manufacturers of products like this um, in those very you know, hidden license agreements, what you're agreeing to do to, to transmit your data. Um, so if, I just wanna remind people to use the Q&A function if they have questions as we're talking through some of these results. So please feel free to do so. It's in the middle of your uh, screen at the bottom. Absolutely. Uh, and then companies can offer monitoring services for this device. You know, I have an example. I think uh, I have a ring doorbell and, and they, uh, <clears throat> they offer to have some advanced features if I pay for it. And manufacturers collect and use data to fix product quality issues. You know, that's, <clears throat> there's a lot to that. You know, when I think about um, cars, if you purchased a car recently, you may have a package where they offer you internet through your car and have it connected. Uh, Audi's was Audi Connect, GM's was, oh, I forget, uh, Chevy Connect or something. And what's funny is they, they, they have you pay for this and, and you connect your car to the internet. And not only are they using that, you know, you get the experience of maybe getting internet through your car and have your maps updated, but they are looking at how people drive. They're streaming your data to try to improve maybe their vehicles. What do you use? What do you not use? Uh, they may in fact sell your data depending on the agreement uh, to other folks, uh, or in some instances, they're using that data to market new products to you. Uh, they might sell monitoring services like Chevy OnStar, things like that. Uh, and they might use that data to fix product quality issues. If Audi has all the data on all the vehicles out on the road that they've produced, and they notice that many of them are having a sensor problem, they can use that to go back to their manufacturing facility. So in fact, all of these things are true. Um, it's all part of this way that they're trying to figure out what's most beneficial to customers, what's most beneficial to them. But indeed, all of these are part of that solution. Excellent, thank you for participating in that. Uh, let's talk about some other, right. other things here. The updating of business models, okay? Now you're looking at a, you know, an aircraft or engine manufacturer like GE or Pratt & Whitney. 
So their business in this market has been making the best turbine engines, the most reliable turbine engines, the most fuel efficient turbine engines you can possibly make and sell to aircraft vendors. It's a very industrial business to business application. Okay? But they started this 10, 15 years ago where they're like, well, we can instrument up our engines, right? And we can collect that data. They actually have a special data uh, sending process with this. They monitor the whole engine on every flight and they transmit the data back when the flight's done. It's, it's terabytes of information for each flight. They can do that. And so, but why would they do that? And in their case, what they can do is instead of just offering, oh, we sell engines. Now they sell the engine and they'll sell on a, a add-on, which is a data monitoring service. So these companies will sell you the engine and then they'll ask you, hey, do you want our predicts platform and the, and, and the um, dashboarding of all your engine health and fuel efficiency? And they will produce for you reports that are on the web immediately after each flight. Hey, this engine is doing something a little strange. You might want to bring it in for a quick check. This one is going to have maintenance in three days. We noticed that this pilot tends to be heavy on the throttle and is, and is costing you gas on takeoff every single time. They, they will provide all that to you as a service in addition to selling engines. So it's an updating and an expansion of their business model based on that type of technology. Another term you might hear is the industrial internet of things. It's a bit more specialized. It refers to information in a production or industrial environment. So in automated warehousing houses or on a production floor, we produce mounds of data. We produce a lot of data and we have our own systems for moving that around. And this is an example of some of the automation pyramids we talk about in manufacturing. And we have this SCADA layer, which is supervisory control and data acquisition that tends to get all that information. And so in some ways we already have, have done a lot of that uh, internet of things type stuff, but it really, with the collection of technologies available with IoT these days, it's, it's sort of creating a small revolution in how we collect data. It's more of an expansion on our traditional data collection where we have much, many more sensors, many more, much more data, and, and we can all track all the way down to individual components as they move throughout a factory if we set this up. So it's just in increasing this to a degree where you have a lot more information everywhere through IoT technologies. I like to think of this, um, this is a very engineering thing, but um, as an instrumentation paradigm shift. So as, as engineers, we would typically, if, if we had a design for say, for example, a, a, a brewing kettle to make beer and we would put on the, the just the right sensors at just where we need on the inputs, the outputs, the temperature, so that we know what we need to know um, for safety, redundancy and process control. Um, we don't wanna put on anything extra because it's very expensive and, and, and there's no need. We know what we need to know. Well, with the advances and availability of IoT technologies, we can put more on there. We can slap on all sorts of sensors that we want. We can try, hey, put on some, put on a humidity sensor. Will that mean anything? I don't know. Put on a vibration sensor. Will that mean anything? I don't know. Put them all on there, collect the data, and then now leverage the power of data analytics to tell us, did any of those make a difference? Can we see trends in the data that we couldn't see before that maybe are, are, are impacting our product? Um, you know, you think about this is a, a, an Emerson uh, smart valve. Well, that's, that's well and good. You, you can access it from the internet, you can turn it on and off, you can monitor it, but now throw on a power meter uh, to see uh, how much power it's taking to open and close it. Maybe that's a sign of early degradation of, of the system or a valve seat Right, you can monitor that and maybe know if it's going to start ripping apart. Add a vibration monitor on there. Uh, maybe it'll tell you if a, a pipe is working its way loose or you have some sort of strange thing pump being pumped through your system. Um, it's, it's, it's really this idea of have a lot more data uh, that you may not sh be sure if it helps, but then you leverage the power of data analytics to then see if it, if it can provide you interesting information. So what, what has really driven IoT to, to be available now? 
Um, why is it gaining in, in popularity uh, or becoming a thing? Because most of this technology has been around for a while. You know, sensors, the internet, all that stuff has been around. But what's driving it? Well, first off, sensors. The, the, the manufacturing of sensors, typically done on a semiconductor chip style line these days, um, the, the cost and size has dropped significantly, okay? In, in our industrial environments, yes, sensors are still hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars because we want them extra rugged. But, you know, sensors are so ubiquitous. Think about how many are in your phone. There's roughly, I don't know, 30 to 40 sensors in your phone, uh, given what make and model you have. Um, and, and the whole phone is made for $100. So sensors, like this little guy right here, this is a temperature, pressure, and humidity sensor. That little chip at the top right, that is the entire sensor. It's smaller than your pinky toenail. Um, and it's under a dollar in price, right? And so the cost of a lot of these chips has come down. You'll find hobbyist sites just filled with cheap sensors. And what can you sense with these sensors? Well, just about anything you think you can physically measure or interact with, there's a sensor for. Uh, some of them are more expensive, but you'll be surprised how, how cheap they are these days to be able to place in just about anything. So that's one part of it, the, the cheapness, ubiquity of sensors, that, that really coming to maturity. The other thing uh, has been, I would say, beyond the, the networks, which have generally increased in, in speed and bandwidth, the ability to stream internet movies all around, especially even in your house. Think about how your internet speed was 10 years ago and the difference that has made. But I would say beyond that, which is more of an infrastructure thing, this interfacing to the internet has also become cheap. I mean, the internet of things wouldn't be possible if you had to plug in a, a wired connection to everything. You wouldn't be running around your Fitbit with a wire hanging from it, right? So you need this radio, the Wi-Fi connective interface to stuff. That used to be a little bit expensive. And, and so again, the volume of it has driven down the price and size of these, the hardware. So that now this is about the size of a quarter where you can get a little Wi-Fi connected radio to a, a chip here that will control all your sensors and things like that. And these are the types of chips that they're putting in, you know, the automated door locks in your house, inside your Fitbit, anything that needs a Wi-Fi connection can take advantage of these really cheap, small chips that allow you to connect to that network. Okay, and that's a, that's a new thing. This is, you know, really started to become cheap and widespread, you know, in the five years ago uh, range. Now, once you produce that data, you generally have to connect it unless you have your own network that's connecting this data, uh, platforms for collecting that data. And cloud-based is important here because of consumer products going out into the world, they have to be able to uh, collect that data from all over, anywhere you have an internet connection and, and you know, have a place where you can access it as a company and then also retransmit it out through apps so that people can log into an app on their phone and see the data from the device that may be on their body. Um, so many cloud platforms are set up for IoT. The big ones like Amazon and Microsoft Azure, they have IoT ingestion um, applications to where if you build your device network, you can connect it up and have your own cloud space for that. Some of the ones that were more industri really, industrially relevant, there's uh, Bosch and GE have their systems. I've shown logos here for Siemens, MindSphere, which is very focused on manufacturing and industrial applications. PTC, their ThingWorks platform is both for industrial and hobbyists that's dedicated to this. But uh, I would say there's roughly 50 that are very common for now taking advantage of IoT data and presenting it to folks. So these things, the, the, the cost and ubiquity of sensors, the overall network bandwidth that has improved in our infrastructure, the ability to interface with the internet through cheap, small hardware, to go in devices, and then the platforms for collecting, aggregating, and presenting this data. Those have really driven this to be possible now. Okay, I, you know, it's hard to talk about this without talking about security and privacy. You know, there are some severe um, privacy concerns with a lot of the, this technology. 
um, in everything from you know camera monitoring uh, through what folks have access to your data and 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 who doesn't. Um, you know the about what was it three two or three years ago everyone updated their privacy policies policies to try to try to be more clear about what they do with your data. But just remember that your data you know, is it's the new oil. It's the commodity that people want, right? So a lot of times when you're thinking about this from a consumer perspective, um, reading those agreements and understanding what your third party is going to do with your data is perhaps the, the, the main thing to, to worry about. From a company point of view, you know, you want to try to secure your data so it doesn't get stolen or you don't have customer data stolen. And just remember that no type of data or communication is absolutely secure, right? What we try to do when we pass around information is encrypt it and put passwords and all that stuff and, 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 and restrictions. Well, that leads to a natural trade-off, an absolute natural trade-off between the accessibility and efficiency of the data. So the more you encrypt it, generally the slower it is being transmitted over networks. Um, and the more you limit accessibility, the less it's to be useful in your company. If you want people to be able to look at the data and, and summarize and have access to it, the more controls you place on that, the worse that is. So that's a fundamental balance that you have to have. And I think a lot of that gets to what data is worth protecting at a high level versus what is not and, and, and how you want to manage who can see what. For industrial systems, uh, most often we make our own local networks um, that are highly controlled and we only can get access to, and then a strong firewall access to the cloud. You could even do this in your house, but for the most part, for the internet of things to work on a consumer side, it has to connect somewhere through the internet. Um, you know, as, as someone who's dealt with some security issues, you know, it, it, security will always depend on the weakest link. The weakest link is, Often someone with a post-it post note of their password on their computer that is like the number one security link, no matter how strong you make your passwords. Um, but also, you know, are, are folks selling your data to a third party? Do you as a company know if, if your data partner that's handling your data is, is bundling? What's, what are their policies on how they handle your data? and things like that. So whether the weakest link is, is a server that's in your, in your thing or a cloud access in your vendor, that's what you have to think about. And you know, this is a, a tough topic, but it's something you do need to work with IT on uh, and follow the latest, latest best practices for, the, for internet security. Excellent, okay, so we're gonna uh, sort of uh, wrap, wrap up most of the discussion here with a final poll question. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, do you think that IoT will have an impact on your business, whatever your business is, you know, whether it ranges from education to production to warehousing to hospital, do you think that IoT will have an impact on your business? Uh, let's see, Steve, do you want to release that poll? Excellent. <clears throat> Give another 30 seconds or so. All right, that's good. Let's go ahead and share the results, Steve. Okay, looking at this. Now, I, I think I know who answered this one just to mess with me, but what is IoT? That's, that's very nice, all right. So uh, many of you said yes, and I think I kind of loaded this question because I said, do you think it will have an impact on your business? I didn't say improve. I didn't say that it would help you. Right? But will it impact your business in some way? 
And I think if, if you realize just how, how much it's already sort of <clears throat> pervaded the things we inter interact with, it's pretty hard to imagine how it won't. Um, you know, even in education, um, you know, I, well, one, I have to teach IoT, obviously, in, in, in our major, but do, do, you know, will we start monitoring different aspects of classroom occupancy and things on campus um, through automated sensors to, to make better decisions? I'm sure we will. I've seen a lot of very impressive stuff done in building management, even through these types of things. You know, it, it, you know the, the I need help and I need to think about it, you know, that's, that's part of what we're here to do um, with the Nextivation e effort and, and the opening of our Digital Innovation Lab in the future. Um, so I hope to be someone who can help work through a lot of these things. I think you, you'll find, you know, driving into Pittsburgh, you're going to see three or four billboards of companies uh, trying to let you know that they can help you with your data. They can help you with IoT. You'll even hear the commercials on the radio. And um, that just shows you that there's a lot out there and a lot of businesses are trying to help other businesses think through this and um, make it work for you. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, some final thoughts. <clears throat> so if you're looking into how data can help your company and, and, and can you improve your business practices through data and these industry 4.0 technologies that we talk about, think about if, if you can collect data, would it help you and from where? Would, would you collect data from your, from your customers? Would you collect it internally? Are there sensors available for that? So think about the potential data that could help your business. That's sort of the first step. Okay. And you know, external data collection from products, right? Offer insights into your, how your customers use it. And uh, they might offer potential for product improvements and, and even new business models, as I discussed, you know, selling a service on top of something you already sell to folks. The internal data collection can help improve your equipment and processes. And you know, this is, I say can help because I don't know if it will help. Maybe you, you understand your equipment very well and you don't need that or it's a very manual process. But in general, having more data can help you make better decisions. So is there opportunity for collecting more data and be able to analyze it throughout your facility? And you know, as a final thought here, for that one person who said, what is IoT? You know, the Internet of Things and the technologies can really be leveraged for this sensor-based data acquisition and, and gathering data from the environment around you and your customers. Uh, with that, uh, as I let Steve wrap up and talk about um, the upcoming foundation, please don't hesitate to type in questions and, and we'll do a little Q&A here. So please use the Q&A box uh, for any yeah. final thoughts or questions. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Dr. Chufi. Yeah, please. Uh ask questions, we've got plenty of time. Uh, what I wanted to say here is that uh, we have two more uh, seminars scheduled. Uh, two weeks from now, uh, there will be a seminar on virtual communication and collaboration tools. What you might know of as uh, like Zoom or GoToMeeting, as well as some of those collaboration tools that could be project management or ideation tools. So uh, that looks to be a really good uh, uh, session. And then uh, two weeks after that, we'll have the data visualization on how you can take your data and visualize it in a way to help you make some of those really good data-driven di decision-making processes. So I have a question here. Uh, Joe, if you wanna, you could see the question. Yeah, yeah. we'll go. So a uh, question here about um, a digital twin and its relationship to IIoT. Um, so a digital twin um, is essentially a model of something physical. Um, so it's a model of either your product, maybe a, you have a, a CAD drawing and uh, a operational physics model of your product or it's of the process that you do. So um, throughput issues, uh, you know, run rate, all developed into a model of your factory. Or you could have a digital twin of, of equipment that you have on, on, on your factory floor. You know, you have a digital twin of an end mill. 
And that digital twin can tell you how it will react to different materials, what its cut speed would be with, with different shapes and bits and things like that. So it's essentially a digital model of something physical. Um, now, how can IIoT interact with that? Well, oftentimes it's the IIoT data that helps build those models, but also as you monitor your factory through all the data streaming in, trying to say, is it working? Is my factory working properly? Or is this machine working properly? You might have some alarms on it or something like that. But you can also run a digital twin of that process while it's running physically. And as the sensor data comes in and things start to vary from your, your digital twin, you can use that for um, a, a more complicated alarming system to say, you know, this, this machine is starting to lose throughput compared to its original model and the way it was. And so the digital twin is saying one thing and our process is saying another. Are we, are we losing a motor? Is something going bad? So that's one thing you can do. You can use it to monitor things that are happening in your facility. You could also have it, um, if you have a sort of digital twin of your product from start to finish and, and, and you have this sort of physics or, or, or digital model of your product, as you build it, you can track the sensor information as you go along and it can be used to complement the twin later on and understand the way it behaves um, in sort of a complicated way. But I would say that a couple things to summarize. <clears throat> The IoT data can be used to make a digital twin of your process, or it can be used to compare against the digital twin of your process. So I, I hope that uh, in some way answered that question. And we may do a session on, on digital twinning at some point for this series or, or follow on to that. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chufi. We do have another question. Now, someone did raise their hand and I don't oh. know who that was, but if you do have a question, uh, please go ahead and, uh, I'll type it out. Uh, our next question is uh, from uh, Corinne Colson. How can non-manufacturing businesses start harnessing the power of data? Is there an easy way or place to start? Yeah, and that's a, a tough one because it can really vary. Um, so, you know, if you're a consumer product company, manufacturing, you know, a lot of this stuff makes sense in manufacturing, consumer product. But the power of data. So, one thing to realize, you do not have to have the hardware to get data. If you're, so I'll, I'll throw in this example of like an insurance company, like, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I forget the brand, but who advertises the Super Bowl, don't mess with my discount sort of thing. Uh, and, and they have a sensor in your car that they've actually produced that so that they can monitor your driving, which scares me given the way I drive. But you don't have to be that company that has to invest in all that to make that. Where could you get Internet of Things data? Well, again, data is the new commodity, right? Uh, it's the new oil. You can buy it. Trust me, if you're looking for information on customers or habits or something in your industry, uh, I think you might be surprised going to your next trade show uh, what companies are out there offering data on use patterns because they're using Internet of Things to take this information. Um, you know, another thing for non-manufacturing, the harness the power of data, I think you might find that as you're buying things, you might see these options available. So for example, if you're in a, in a hospital environment, and yeah, they have their own data issues, but you're gonna see that now all the devices are gonna have their own connection, their own data, their own thing to the internet uh, or through a hospital network that will provide that data for you. So even if you're not in manufacturing, you're just running a business, whatever it is, an office, you might find that now you're gonna start being able to buy products that are connected to the internet in different ways. Um, printers are a silly example. They've been around for a while, but I, I think you'll find that it's becoming even more functional to get all that information up to the cloud and see about your printing habits. And, you know, of course, they'll send you reminders to buy ink because that's their business, but them knowing that you're low on ink is something that is, I guess, both helpful to you and helpful to them. So for non-manufacturing, just look at it. Look at, is there data out there that someone's collecting that can help you with your business? 
And two, when you go to upgrade or purchase things, keep an eye out for the IoT stuff that's in it. And if that could help you then make decisions in your company. So thank you for that um, question. And I hope that answered it. Yeah. Any more questions um, while you're typing that in? Dr. Chufi, I do have a question. Let's say I'm a real small operation, whether I'm a, a machine shop or a fabrication shop. What could be some of the simplest, uh, maybe uh, short term or, or easy things to get started with on the manufacturing side with IoT? Yeah, this, is, this comes up a lot. Um, most of the pre-built IoT sensors. So for example, if, if you wanna know where your energy consumption is coming from, Fluke or, um, or uh, uh, Eaton would be happy to sell you their ten dollars to $20,000 sensor uh, system that you can put on a whole bunch of power monitorings. They give you a kit that starts, they give you a whole nice web interface. That's great. Um, and, and, and you'll see more of that out there. And I encourage you, if you can afford that kind of stuff, to talk with those folks. But you know, I'm, I'm a university setting, we cobble together things. Um, I, I mentioned the hobbyist industry, you know, it's driving a lot of some of this really cheap stuff you can try. If you are savvy and you wanna try it, you can buy current sensors that will monitor power for 10 bucks a piece, right? And you can build your own little collection with a $20 microchip. Um, it is much easier than it used to be to do that hobbyist level stuff because of the popularity of Arduinos. And you can just do a trial one run to say, hmm, can I take power off my uh, off this piece of equipment and see what it looks like and how much I'm using per part? Uh, you can for under $100 in hardware, now it takes some, some engineer or tech time to set it up. Can I get enough data to actually make some decisions on how I run the tool? And those little sort of test the water studies because of the, the, the cost and the availability have become much easier. So um, there's that. And then there's also, again, that idea of uh, the non-manufacturing side where buying equipment now that has this data already in there, that's things to look out for, or also uh, buying data that's already currently available. I think you'll find that a lot of your vendors, even as a small manufacturer, your next generation of equipment, I guarantee you they're gonna tell you, oh, do you want the internet connected tool? We'll also sell you this monitoring. It'll be great because you'll get all these advances and we'll, we can look at your data or we can sell you this data uh, you know, suite. So even for a small manufacturer that might buy a new piece of equipment, I think you'll see that. Um, but I, I also encourage, and I, and I hope to help everybody with this, I, I wanna encourage those sort of small steps where you take a little bit of data and see what you can do with it. Um, sort of generate some interest before you invest in something that's going to require a huge ROI or a large amount of capital. So, uh, Steve, those are my those are my sort of recommendations. Mm. Oh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, any more questions? We still have some time. Uh, feel free to uh, type it in. Um, right now, I think we've answered all the questions that were given us. Um, why don't we do this? Uh, I want to thank Dr. Chufi very much for giving an excellent presentation on uh, really the intro and fundamentals of the Internet of Things. I think there's a lot here that uh, we can uh, glean and learn from and apply. And uh, our next uh, session will be two weeks from today, and that will be focusing on virtual communication and collaboration tools. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, Having you uh, join us for that, uh, finding out that uh, the tools that we use, such as Zoom as we're using right now, it's not the easiest thing necessary to learn, but we can try to help uh, organizations like yourself or people learn how to use these most effectively. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. We hope you uh, enjoyed the talk. Uh, these sessions are recorded and will be available on the Nextivation website. Uh, very simple, it's nextivation.org. So we hope to see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Have a great day.